Um, yeah, I'm Wayne Spencer with the Conservation Biology Institute. We're in some ways similar to PRBO. Um, we're a, a nonprofit, a science-based organization. We, we provide science support, analyses, field research, advice, and so on for efforts to conserve biological diversity. Um, I am, by background, I, I've got degrees in forestry and wildlife management and a PhD in ecology. Um, I'm a conservation biologist. Most of my field work has been with rare and endangered mammals, um, including martens and fishers in the Sierra Nevada. Um, but uh, the, one of the greatest strengths of, uh, of CBI, Conservation Biology Institute, is our staff of sort of crack GIS folks and modelers um, who keep up with sort of the cutting edge of, of uh, spatially explicit modeling, species distributions, population modeling, climate effects um, modeling, that, that sort of thing. So I'm going to be showing you, in, at least in the second half of my talk here, um, models actually done by, not by me, I'm not really a modeler, but I kind of direct uh, what they do. So um, Ryan's talk did a really good job of sort of setting up mine, because um, his focus was on sort of the, the effects of treatments, individual treatments at sort of the fairly fine scale on individual species, and so showing that there are winners and losers depending on the habitat characteristics each species requires. I'm going to be taking a larger, longer term view, sort of scaling up and thinking at the sort of at the cumulative um, effects over large landscapes or at the, at the level of whole populations of species rather than the individuals in a local area and thinking about the long term. And really the point of my talk is to, is to have, is to kind of encourage people to understand the overall ecological um, big scale context within which treatments are occurring. And by focusing only on individual treatment effects, um, you're missing some of the most important uh, effects, which are really what's happening at the scale of whole populations and ecological processes at the big scale. I may need some help in figuring out how to navigate. <laughs> how do I move ahead here? The, button, the left and right arrow at the bottom of your slide. Aha. There you go. OK. So a quick overview of my presentation. I'm, I'm going to go over some basic concepts first and then give a case study to show one approach to thinking about these large scale, what I'm calling competing risks. Um, the basic concepts I'll go over can, can people see my arrow, or should I use this thing? There. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about the concept of ecological resil resiliency and the importance of disturbance processes, such as fire, which Ryan pointed out is probably the major uh, disturbance factor in the Sierra Nevada. Um, some of the effects that humans have had on ecological processes and how that changes the picture for management. Um, we can't ignore, obviously, climate change, um, which is complicating all of this. Um, I, I won't go into depth on that, but we need to touch on it. And I'll go into some depth on this issue of competing risks and, to some degree, competing goals in forest management. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. But what we're doing um, with, say, fuels treatments and prescribed fire and so on in the Sierra Nevada is managers have to constantly be balancing competing risks. You know, a treatment may have negative effects on some species, positive on others. It may be decreasing the um, risk of, of future fire, or say severe crown fire in an area, um, but at, at the risk of harming a population of another species. And so we're, we're constantly having to balance those things. And that's really the heart of my talk, is how to think about that and the importance in thinking about it of scale and considering the big picture and the long term. Um, and then I'll, I'll illustrate this with a case study with uh, the fisher, which is a, a rare um, mammal found in the Sierra Nevada. 
Okay, this idea of resiliency. Uh, we all know that ecosystems have disturbances, man-made disturbances as well as natural disturbances. And resiliency is the idea that um, a system has the capacity to either re remain within a natural range of variability in spite of um, disturbances or to return to a natural range of variability in terms of function, structure, and components. You know, disturbances like fire and drought and insects and, and so on are natural. They, they happen, and it doesn't wipe species populations out in, in most cases. Um, and we have to keep in mind that since all of the wildlife uh, species that currently are extant in the Sierra Nevada have been through many, many um, changes and disturbances already. Um, at the bottom, this graph is actually from San Diego County from a long-term study of mammal communities in coastal sage scrub just to sort of illustrate um, some examples of resiliency. This particular species is the San Diego pocket mouse, um, and it's from a long-term study by San Diego State University in, with, I think it's 10 different plots in um, these coastal sage scrub communities. And my little arrow is not responding, but um, you can see in the early early time period the the populations bounce around. There's some randomness, um, and then in 2003 we had the major firestorms down here, which burned all of the plots, all of the Rancho Humul ecological reserve. But you see, there's essentially no effect. On, on these populations. They're resilient to fire. They, they live in burrows under the ground, so they survive. They cache seeds under the ground, um, and uh, their food survives. So they did just fine. The following winter, we had record rains, and boom, there's a population crash because the animals got, the animals and their food stores got saturated. Um, but still, it recovers back to a natural range of variation over time. So nature is resilient to these sorts of disturbances. However, humans have greatly altered the playing field, um, making things uh, potentially less resilient through habitat loss, fragmentation, alteration, the harvest of wildlife species. For example, we, we killed out grizzly bears. We no longer have them. Um, we've introduced a lot of species, and, and we've basically changed many ecological processes. And the important one today is obviously as we've talked about multiple times, we've changed the natural fire regime of the Sierra Nevada through fire suppression, through harvest in the past, um, and so on. So management um, has to consider how the human, how humans have altered the playing field in balancing competing risks and competing goals, and that is what makes it so difficult. Some examples of what I mean by competing risks. Um, a fire breaks out near a community. We naturally we suppress it. We try and put it out um, to protect, uh, say, human residences or other um, natural resources that we need to protect. So we're reducing risks through fire suppression, but this in turn may be increasing future risks in the same area as the fuels build up even more. And it increases the need to use less natural treatment methods, as, as Ryan's talk pointed out. Um, fire is the best way to sort of um, return natural conditions and, and habitat mosaics um, rather than mechanical mastication or thinning. But if you're close to a community or a place where the, the risk of a prescribed fire is just too high, um, we have to manage it in an expensive way. Um, now, prescribed fires may reduce future wildfire risks, but in the short term, they impair air quality, and there's always the potential that they, too, will burn out of control. So managers are constantly assessing these competing risks when trying to plan for prescribed fire. And then finally, any fuels treatment, as Ryan's talk so nicely showed, may adversely affect some species but benefit others, and in the long term, they can reduce the risks of even worse effects over larger areas via severe, say, crown-replacing wildfires. Now, all of this, of course, um, is being complicated by climate change. I'm not going to go into depth 
tests on this, but we know that things are changing, and this is also um, likely increasing fire risks into the future as our natural fire regime changes with decreases in snow, for example, um, greater droughts, uh, more severe fire weather. Now, um, the implications of changes for fire in the Sierra Nevada are, are, have become pretty clear. Um, again, due to historic fire suppression, harvest techniques, and climate change, we are seeing an increase in the annual area burned in the Sierra Nevada. The mean fire size, so the average size of the fires is increasing. The maximum fire size is increasing. And perhaps most troubling to ecologists is the fire severity. Um, these are the, this is the percent of fires that are, that are rated as high severity, which, which means uh, killing the majority of overstory or mature trees. And this is really the concern. When you have crown fires that are replacing even the largest trees that are supposed to be um, resistant, such as large sequoias or ponderosa pines, um, if those are being killed over large areas, you have a problem. So in sum, managing for forest resiliency is a very tough job because of complex and probabilistic or stochastic interactions between all of these different ecological processes and disturbance factors. Once a fire goes through, it changes the structure, it changes the fuels, it changes habitat for wildlife. Wildlife populations interact, uh, weather effects, vegetation treatments, all of these things are interacting over broad landscapes in very complex ways that we can't fully grasp or fully assess without some of the sorts of techniques that I'll be introducing in the second half of this talk. And it's important to keep in mind that this is happening over multiple scales of interest. At the individual or local scale, um, such as what Ryan's talk focused on, at the, at the scale of an individual treatment, which may be affecting habitat for any given species, at the scale of, of whole stand com or ecological communities, and then the, the level that I'll be focused on for most of the talk is at the scale of a whole landscape or the cumulative effects of all these things on populations of a species over broad areas and potentially even over longer term or even evolutionary time scales. Now, keeping the big picture in mind is, is critical. We have to think big and long term. It's populations that count to ecologists and to maintaining our wildlife populations, not just individuals, um, and sometimes metapopulations. For example, you may have a fire or a treatment that takes out a patch of habitat that is occupied by an endangered species. Um, over time, the species may recolonize from an adjacent patch. If you take out this, this important central patch, you may be having a greater effect on, on the entire population than if you're taking out some sort of satellite patch that isn't critical to the functioning of the whole. So the spatial context is important, and the population processes, such as colonization events, dispersal events, are important to keep in mind. And you have to think long term. That doesn't mean we can ignore the small or local effects. Um, they are very important. But I'm going to be focusing on how these fit into this bigger picture. And I keep stressing. Um, the importance of thinking about populations, not just individuals or not just local effects. Um, and ecologists aren't so worried about losing an individual or a few individuals. They're interested or um, in maintaining whole populations from extinction. This is a, a graph from a recent study by Trail et al. Um, they analyzed about 1,200 different species that had sufficient data and analyses of what's called minimum population, viable population size. Um, and what it shows is averaged across, again, this is many, many species you know, of all different types, birds, mammals, insects, uh, things that walk, things that crawl, things with 
short lives, things with long lives. So it's, there's a, there would be a lot of scatter in this data, but this shows the central tendencies and what are some very strong patterns that, are, that emerge. Um, and basically it shows the population size versus its probability of persisting. So this darker black line, and, and notice that the scale is logarithmic logarithmic, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and this is also logarithmic, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. What this line is showing is that averaged over all these species, there's a clear trend of you need a population of hundreds of individuals to have a 50-50, that's what this line shows, 50-50 chance of it persisting for a decade or more, and you have to have over a, you have to have thousands of individuals to have a 50-50 chance of it surviving, of the population surviving, for at least a century. Of course, 50-50 is not good odds, and conservation biologists don't like to talk in those terms. So this shows the 90% probability. Um, and, and what this is telling us is that you need many hundreds or even a few thousand individuals to have a 90% chance of surviving for more than a decade or two. And you need thousands of individuals to have a 90% probability of lasting for at least a century. Now, to put this into perspective for the Sierra Nevada, here's two species of concern. Calif the California spotted owl, there's roughly three to 4,000 individual owls, I understand. So it, it's in the ballpark where it has a good chance, you know, given no more major negative effects, of maybe lasting 100 years, and so it, it deserves close management and monitoring. A species I'll be um, let's see, focused on for most of this talk is the fisher, which there are probably less than 300 individuals in the southern Sierra Nevada. So that shows you what the conundrum is. Um, without active management, it doesn't have a very good chance of persisting for more than a few more decades. OK, I'm going to take a pause to um, answer any questions and make sure everyone's caught up. So uh, if there's any questions, you can an answer them in the chat box over there. There aren't any questions yet for Wayne. OK, then I'll move on Good. and present the case study of how to, a way of um, thinking about these large landscape level, population level effects or cumulative effects of treatments and fires on a species. And this is the fisher. As I mentioned, um, we have an isolated population from Yosemite National Park south um, of less than 300 adults. Uh, the species is closely associated with those forests that are the greatest target for fuels reductions. Um, dense canopy, often multi-storied canopy, ladder fuels and, and whatnot. They require large trees, lots of big dead woody structures. They're in that mixed conifer or conifer hardwood zone, the sort of mid-elevations. And re basically, this puts fissures in the crosshairs of the controversy between fuels reductions to remove all these things that fishers like, like large woody structures, dense canopy, ladder fuels, and so on, um, and reducing the risks of wildfires. So CBI was asked by the Forest Service to assess, as a result of this conflict, which had conservationists warring with the Forest Service over fuels reductions programs, um, to help analyze and assess how best to go about at the landscape level reducing fire risks while maintaining the fisher population. And I should mention at this point that it wasn't just us. We had a large cadre of independent science advisors from universities as well as agencies um, and a large stakeholder group. There may be some of the people on the phone who were part of that. So this whole process um, was guided by a lot of input from a lot of experts. Now. The approach to addressing this is sort of summarized in this graphic here. Um, and this is the competing risks equation. Vegetation or fuels management is intended 
to reduce wildfire. So I'm showing these as hypotheses. Hypothesis one, fuels treatments may reduce the severity or extent of wildfire on the landscape. That's the intent. Hypothesis two, vegetation management can also have direct negative impacts on the fisher population. That's why the conservationists were upset. Um, removing the habitat elements that are required by fishers can have an adverse direct effect on the fisher population. But then hypothesis three, so can wildfires, potentially over much larger areas and more severe um, effects, such as with a stand replacing crown fire that takes out all of the trees, um, wildfire can have a negative effect on the fisher population. But the most interesting question then is concerning hypothesis four, the potential for indirect positive effects of vegetation treatment on fishers because they reduce the risk of large severe wildfires, they can actually benefit the fisher population. So the, the key question is under what conditions do, does this cumulative effect of potential for indirect positive effects on maintaining the fisher population by reducing wildfire more than compensate for the direct negative effects of the treatments themselves on fishers. So we did this in a computer simulation environment guided, as I said, by many uh, experts and scientists, including fire experts at um, U.S. Forest Service. The study area included the three national forests of the southern Sierra Nevada, Stanislaw, Sierra, and Sequoia, as well as the two big national park complexes. This white line shows our modeling area overlaid on those forests and parks. And it encompasses all the known habitat occupied or potentially occupiable by fishers. The modeling approach is very complex, and I can't even begin to go into all the technical details of, of creating and calibrating and testing all of these models. So I'll, I'll be pretty sparse on the technical details. But we coupled three different models, spatially explicit models. First is a fisher occupancy model, or you can think of it as a habitat quality model. Um, this work was recently published in Biological Conservation. Um, the model was built directly from uh, fisher detection, non-detection, or presence absence data systematically collected over about a six-year period by the Fisher Monitoring uh, Program, the US Forest Service. A, a really excellent data set for this sort of thing that we almost never have the luxury of having this quality of data to do this sort of work. Um, and what the model does is it predicts, it, it gives a probability of fisher occurrence or you can think of it as habitat value, if you wish, um, from zero to one. And it uses GIS variables, sort of averaged or smoothed over a five square kilometer moving window, so th roughly the size of a small female territory. Once we had that model, we coupled it with a population model, um, which is stochastic. There's some randomness to births and deaths and dispersal. But the important thing is that this particular um, spatially explicit population model assumes that these demographic parameter values scale with habitat quality. So if you're in an area of very high quality or high fisher occupancy, uh, the probability of giving birth and surviving through the year is higher than if you're in a low probability or low value area. And once we had that, those two models all calibrated and working, we coupled them with a spatially explicit veget landscape vegetation dynamics model, which simulates forest dynamics, um, tree and shrub growth, reproduction, and so on, and disturbance factors. You can simulate fires, thinning, harvest, and so on. And basically what this model does is it tracks each individual tree and shrub species by age cohorts and tracks the biomass as trees grow and shade each other out and die or burn, and it spits out over time uh, different maps at whatever time intervals you want. 
Here's just illustrating the habitat model. Um, if you squint, you can see there's little dark dots. Those are areas at which fissures have been detected. Um, and then if you see the little X's, those are areas that despite multiple years of, of uh, monitoring, fissures have never been detected. And the important thing is that this surface that goes from dark brown to lighter yellow shows the probability of fissure occupancy, where the dark browns have a high probability or high value. And you can see it's in this fairly narrow band uh, on the western slope at the mid elevations of the Sierra Nevada that's occupied by fissures, and then other areas that are unoccupied by fissures. Um, some, and just for, for the modeler types on the phone, it has an AUC value of 0.941, which is excellent. That's on a scale of, of from 0 to 1. Um, so 0.94 means the, the model has a very good fit to the data. A couple of things to point out. We know we're undervaluing habitat in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. Um, that's because of missing environmental data there. Um, so that's one problem with the model. And then an important thing to know is that Yosemite Valley, the Merced River, is a dividing line between the occupied fisher habitat and unoccupied. Even though the model extrapolates and says that there's high quality habitat here, there is no fisher population north of Yosemite Valley, uh, which is one of the key questions we're investigating. And we have a lot of clues now as to what's going on there. Um, the Merced Grove area is excellent fisher habitat. And although occasionally fishers are observed there or are killed on roads in the park, they have not yet established a population. And I'll mention why that is in just a bit. Um, let me go back. I'm going to. Next focus on, on this area here, which is where the Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Program, run by UC Berkeley with Rick Schweitzer as the director, is uh, doing an intensive study of the fisher population and the effects of fuel treatments on the fisher population. And they're using our model to help guide their research and structure it. So here is our model predictions of the probability of fisher occurrence overlaid with um, Female, uh, maternal and natal den trees. Natal den trees are where the female gives birth, and then they often will move the kits every two or three weeks to a new den site. And you can see that, for the most part, they're, they're in areas of, of high predicted probability. So they're finding our model quite useful for stratifying sampling and, and testing hypotheses. OK, once we have that, we couple it with a population model. But maybe I'll pause first and see if there's any questions. Uh, do we have any questions? Nope, none yet. OK, moving on. OK, so now we have the population model overlaid on that habitat model. And what this model, which is called PATCH, does is it models female territories, fe females being the most important component of any population. And if you squint, you can see these little hexagons. Those are female territories in the model world. And the darkness, again, darker brown indicates more reliably occupied. And it corresponds very closely to the high value habitat from the habitat model. So one of the things this is illustrating is because populations are dynamic and there's a lot of uh, random processes in the real world, um, fissures are sometimes seen in places you would not expect them to be. They, they have a mind of their own. They move around. They disperse. And sometimes they're observed in places where the habitat is not good. And often people, when they look at these sorts of models, they say, well, your, your model is giving us a wrong answer because I saw a fissure outside of where it should be. Well, that's the random nature of nature. Um, and what this shows you is running over a 20-year period, this population model, sometimes fissures, you see these yellow territories scattered around will occupy a, a marginal area because there's nowhere else to go, or they just happen to end up there when dispersal season ended. But the highest quality habitat is where you expect them to be most reliably uh, detected over time. Now, another thing that we're showing here is if you see this blue line, in this first model run, we constrained the population. We would not allow it to disperse, animals to disperse across the Merced River, Yosemite Valley. 
so that we could calculate a population size or a carrying capacity in the existing uh, occupied area. And um, what we found is by varying territory size over a reasonable, um, biologically reasonable range, we estimated a carrying capacity of 50 to 150 females, or if you double this, 100 to 300 adult individuals. Um, now that doesn't count this unoccupied potential habitat north of Yosemite Valley. Um, and you can see the model says that there ought to be fishers there. Another way, another interesting thing you can do with these sorts of models is look, look at population source sink dynamics. Um, on this, th this is the same model outputs, but shown in a different way. Over a 20 year period, um, green territories are those where births exceed deaths. So they're sources of individual fishers that may, you know, have to disperse and find a, a territory of their own. And the reds and oranges are what are called sink territories or sink areas. That means deaths exceed births in those areas. Now, and, and obviously they tend to be in the lower quality habitat near the sources because, again, a, a young female born here is going to have to leave her, female, her mother's territory and settle somewhere else. And her probability of reproducing in a poor quality habitat or of surviving for two or three years is low. Now, I, I point this out because, again, this is something that non-population biologists often get confused by, um, thinking that, well, sinks are bad. Maybe we should go in and remove trees here um, from these sink areas because that's where fishers go to die. But no, you have to think about the big picture. These are the young females that are dispersing off mom's excellent territory and have to bide their time in a suboptimal territory for a year or two until they can inherit and get a good territory on which they're more likely to reproduce. So sink habitat areas may be just as important to sustaining the entire population as those source territories. So uh, again, don't fall into the pattern of thinking that sink is bad, so let's put our fuels treatments there and remove all habitat value. Now, I've mentioned multiple times that fishers are not found currently north of Yosemite Valley except for an occasional, usually male, disperser. Our original parameter values for births and deaths and dispersal were based on the published literature on fishers, from, mostly from other areas, and they tended to be fairly optimistic. Um, this shows that potential for population expansion under our model's assumptions. Um, and it shows that fishers ought to disperse and establish new source territories north of the Yosemite River, or the Merced River. However, they're not. And it's turning out now from the Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Program uh, intensive population study, as well as the Kings River Fisher study a little bit to the south, that the mortality of adult fishers in, in the Sierra Nevada is higher than you would expect because of human changes to the landscape. Fisher, and this is called additive mortality when it's mortality over and above the sort of the background, the natural background level you'd expect due to uh, starvation, predation, old age, and so on. Fishers are being killed by cars. They're getting diseases from human cats and dogs, such as canine distemper. And most startlingly, um, the vast majority of fishers in California are poisoned by or, or have rodenticide exposure. 20 out of 24 fisher livers that have been sampled in the last year show positive reading for second generation rodenticides. And we now believe that even some of the quote unquote natural deaths that are occurring due to predation and other factors is because the animals are weakened by this rodenticide exposure, putting them at greater risk. And there have been some, at least two or three direct mortalities of rodenticide poisoning of fishers. So what we did was modeled with these elevated mortality rates. And when you get down into um, a 15 to 20% increase in mortality over our original predictions, this potential to disperse and establish north of Yosemite Valley goes away. And indeed, what they're actually measuring in the field is right in this ballpark of about 18% percent 
higher mortality than our original model predicted. All the more reason that we have to be very careful with field treatments to not do further harm to this po population on the edge. Okay, now on to the landscape modeling part, but again, first, any questions? If not... Hearing none, we proceed forward. Okie doke. Okay, again, I can't go into the technical details. This, um, landscape vegetation modeling stuff is extremely complicated, but just um, vegetation is tracked as by, by each tree and shrub species over time at whatever sort of time intervals you choose, um, and each... Uh, cell on the landscape, and they're one hectare cells, it's keeping track of biomass, age, and species composition of all of these species over time as they grow, shade each other out, get burned, get removed by harvest, or whatever. And all of these parameters are influenced by climate zone, by elevation, slope, aspects, soils, etc. Um, it gets extremely complicated. But you can simulate, then, different scenarios with different assumptions about fire regimes, about wind throw, about insects and disease, fuel treatments, harvest, and so on. So this is what we're interested in, in looking at the competing risks to the fisher population and their habitat. OK, I'm, I'm not going to go into more detail on the modeling, but just to kind of show you a, a quick um, overview of the sorts of outputs and, and what can happen. This is, again, zoomed in on the central part of the study area. You see Yosemite at the top. This is the Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Fisher Area, the Kings River Fisher Area, that's Shaver Lake. And down here is Sequoia and Kings Canyon. The darker brown is greater than 50% probability of fisher occupancy, and the lighter brown is a, a 10 to 50% probability. So that's under the current condition that's what our model says is the distribution of, of fissures. And I'm going to show you, um, just for a single replicate, remember all these models have randomness or stochasticity built in, so you have to run multiple runs to get at the variability. I'm going to show you just one example um, where we assumed that the future fire regime is will be more severe than the, the fire regime we've seen in recent in, in the last 20 years, basically, the model, the fire modeling was calibrated based on a recent 20-year window of data, and then we assumed a, a that given climate change and fuel changes and so on, that the future is going to be more severe in terms of fire conditions. And in this particular run, we're doing no management, no fuels treatments whatsoever. Okay, and I'm going to first just show you uh, five years worth of accumulated fire on this landscape. So this is five years of running that vegetation model, and these, these fires um, have random ignition points, but it's biased based on you know, closer to the wildland urban interface, there's a higher uh, ignition rate. In areas that are prone to lightning strike, there's a higher rate. But then the spread is modeled based on weather conditions and fuel conditions where that fire is. Um, so this is just showing, again, five years' worth of, of fire on the landscape. And here's Shaver Lake. Picture that fire. And I'm going to first back up. Again, here's the habitat under at year zero. Then you have a bunch of fires happen. And then growth and succession are happening. And if this will move forward, you notice that fire took out a big patch of habitat here. So by year 10, this is what the habitat looks like. And I'm going to go in 10-year intervals, year 20, year 30, year 40. You see a little bit of regrowth in between here, and year 50. And what this illustrates is the, the nightmare scenario of if you have a bunch of severe fires that fragment the habitat into smaller areas that are more isolated, and you're starting to get beyond the potential dispersal, you're fragmenting the population into multiple smaller populations, which is not what you want to see. OK, now we coupled that with our population model. 
And this graph just shows one replicate, one run of the population model on that exact same landscape that I just stepped you through. So that was that same replicate of the fire scenario. And what we do is first we have to run the, the population model for a period of about 10 years just so it kind of sorts out the sex and age uh, categories and comes to an equilibrium. We call that simulation year zero. And then that's the equilibration period. And then each decade, we exported that revised uh, biomass map from the landscape model into our habitat model and, and then run the population model on this changing habitat background. And, it, and then at the end, by year 60, we record the ending number of females in the population. And recall that example I gave was a pretty extreme one with some very extreme fire events and no management. And you can see what happened over time. It started to grow, and there were some fires that went down. It crashed here because of fires. Another big crash here when that population got fragmented. And the ending population of fishers is less than half of what it was at the beginning. Now, of course, there's a lot of randomness in these things, so we have to run these multiple times to get at the variability. And so for each one of those landis or, or vegetation model scenarios, we ran the population model 10 times. And you can see there's some randomness here, but um, a drop off here across because of major fires. And so then we record the mean and standard deviation in the ending population size to compare the relative effects among different scenarios. And here's a refresher on our four hypotheses. So in these coupled model scenarios, vegetation management may be reducing wildfire. Wildfire may be reducing the fisher population. Vegetation management may be impacting the fisher population. But by reducing the risk of large, severe fires, there could be indirect positive effects of treatments on fishers. And so we did this in a simulation environment um, in a factorial experimental design so we could look at these relative risks. We modeled two different fire regimes, one again calibrated on a recent 20 years of fire data, and then one assuming uh, heightened fire conditions due to climate change and other effects into the future. And then we looked at a bunch of different treatment scenarios, and I'll, I'll describe those in just a bit. And then for each scenario, we had to run the the landscape model 10 times, and on each one of those, run the population model 10 times. So a whole lot of intensive simulations. And in the end, we use a fancy statistical technique called structural equation modeling, which allows you to tease apart the relative effect of these various factors on the ending Fisher population size. Here's the treatment scenario inputs. Um, we the treatment rate is the proportion of the treatable landscape after omitting wilderness areas and omitting um, like the spotted owl core areas where you can't treat. Um, and we, for most of the simulations, ran either 4% of the landscape treated every five years or 8%. When we ran, we did pilot tests with less than 4% um, of the landscape being treated. and the effect on fire behavior is so minimal um, that it has essentially no effect. And what the take home message here is, the Forest Service in recent years, I, I understand, has been treating about 2% of the landscape. That may be useful in protecting a particular community or area, but at the landscape, at the cumulative landscape scale, it's not enough to really affect fires. We did two different types of treatments. Both were thinning from below, followed by prescribed fire, a light touch treatment that took out the smallest understory trees out to a maximum diameter of 12 inches, and then a, a medium treatment that took trees as large as 30 inch diameter, again, preferentially removing the smaller understory trees. And then we looked after the fact at whether treatments happened to fall inside or outside of fisher habitat. Here's really quickly are four hypotheses. And it's pretty much what you might expect for these first three. Yeah, treatments, at le as long as you treat at least 4% of the landscape every five years, can reduce the extent of fire. And the treatment intensity really had very little effect on that. Um, 
if you could magically remove all fire from the landscape, but you went ahead and did fuels treatments, that's what's shown in this graph. Of course, you can't do that, but that would have a negative effect on fissures. Um, that's kind of obvious. Um, and then, of course, wildfires directly reduce fissures, especially under this heightened fire regime. But those three hypotheses are kind of silly on their own because it's the interactions that count. And so the most important question is that hypothesis four, under what conditions do the indirect positive effects of treatments outweigh the, dire the um, direct negative effects? Under our baseline fire regime, assuming the future looks like the recent past, treatments outside of fisher habitat had essentially no effect. And what, in all cases, the blue bar above the zero line are, is that indirect positive effect, and the green below is the direct negative effect. And you can see that under baseline conditions, although, yes, there are direct negative effects on the population of treatments, there's a slight increase, there's a slightly higher indirect positive effect because they reduce the probability of large, severe fires. Under a heightened fire regime, these effects are magnified, um, and treatments both inside and outside of fisher habitat can have a, a beneficial effect because under a heightened fire regime, even fires that start well outside fisher habitat have the potential to spread into fisher habitat. So summary of key findings. At the landscape population scale, and that's important to keep in mind, um, strategic fuel treatments can increase resiliency of both the forest and fisher populations. Treatment effectiveness will likely be greater if indeed the future be is worse than the recent past in terms of fire conditions. Placement of treatments both inside and outside of fisher habitat may be a good strategy. Um, but we need to get more refined with the modeling to really hone in on an optimal solution set. There's an awful lot of things we could not simulate in this um, under budget and schedule constraints, and we'd love to do more to now kind of hone in on an optimal strategy. Um, so we recommend using this sort of structured landscape scale simulation approach to further explore these probabilistic interactions between these different types of disturbance events. Um, try and hone in on an optimal strategy to really um, cite fuels treatments to have the greatest effect, with uh, positive effect with the least negative effect. And this approach is great for generating hypotheses to test with monitoring data. We can never get away from we need field studies to not only generate these models and make them realistic, but test them and test the hypotheses they produce. I want to do just a quick shout out to remind us that we can't ignore the local scale or stand scale. And two recent important publications from the Pacific Southwest Research Station, Bill Zielinski et al. Um, developed a method for using uh, forest vegetation simulator software with um, forest inventory and analysis data to look at effects of different treatment approaches on fisher habitat at the local scale. One good thing about FVS, Forest Vegetation Simulator, that actually gives you a picture, a graphic, of what a forest stand looks like. And what they looked at is like, here with no treatment, you see this value of fisher habitat increasing with growth over time. And then under three different treatment intensities, treatment may have a, a short-term negative effect here but then it'll recover pretty quickly. With a more severe treatment, they knock it, knock it down more, and it'll take a longer time to recover back to fisher habitat. So coupling these different scales of analyses it should be very useful in the future, and we're planning to do just that with Bill Zielinski and others. Another important uh, recent publication is GTR 220, General Technical Report 220, um, and this is a wise sort of ecologically based approach to restoring more natural uh, habitat mosaics that break up the fuel um, in a way that works with the landscape. Recognizing that steeper slopes or like south facing slopes naturally have less dense canopy than drainages or low lying areas. And so at the stand scale, this is a very useful guidance uh, for how to plan treatments on the landscape. Um, so finally, in conclusion, 
Managing for wildlife persistence requires understanding the net cumulative effects of all these non-independent stochastic disturbance events at broad scales. One of the best ways to consider this stuff is use simulation experiments verified by field monitoring. This approach certainly does not replace the need for good insightful sighting and design of treatments on the ground, as Ryan talked about, but it can give us a context within which to plan treatments and try and predict their effects on populations. We'd like to see this um, applied to other species. It'd be useful to do this sort of thing with spotted owls, blackback woodpeckers, martens, maybe other, other species in the future. And with that, I'll close and just say, is there any time for final questions?